The next speaker is uh, Marc Bouglier. He's the head of uh, gastro gastroenterology and pathology at St. Joseph Hospital in Marseille. He will um, deliver a presentation of treatment of patients with the compensated liver cirrhosis who benefits, who deteriorate. And I'm really anxious to understand whether he could really have the point of no return unraveled. Okay, Mark. Thank you, Massimo. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Stefan and Ira for the kind invitation. It's always a pleasure to be in Frankfurt at this time of the year. And my task today will be to discuss the treatment of patients with decompensated liver cirrhosis, who benefits, who deteriorates, and where is the point of no return. So this is my disclosure. And first of all, I would like to see with you where we are coming from. And if we look at the result of the treatment of decompensated cirrhotic patients at the time of PEG and Y by containing the regimens, the result was very poor with a very weak SVR rate between 7 to 16 percent and moreover a very high rate of uh, infections and uh, deaths related to infections. So clearly at that time there was no options, no therapeutic options for those decompensated cirrhotic patients with PEG and Y bar. And moreover, we know that, uh, and that's the German study showing that uh, if you look at the risk of decompensations according to the MELT score, you can see that you, as soon as you reach a MELT score of 10 and over 10, the risk of decompensation seems is over 50%, which is huge, and therefore preclude to do any kind of therapeutic options. So where are we now in the new era of DA combinations? As you all know, during the last year, seven drugs were released, at least in the US and in Europe, and therefore now we have data for decompensated cirrhotic patients. So which drug can be used in decompensated cirrhotic patients? Not all drugs. And clearly we have data showing that we can use sofosbuvir, we can use daclatasvir, we can use lidipasvir, we can use simeprevir only in child pukes B patients, and in child pukes C, simeprevir should not be used, and paritaprevir, ombitasvir, and dazabuvir should not be used in child B and C patients. So who benefits from these uh, uh, drug combinations? First, looks at the SVR. Here you can see the sum up of all the, the studies uh, published so far on the compensated cirrhotics. So clearly there is no room for sofosbuvir, PEG, and RIBA. In the recent paper published in the hepatology, if you look a little bit deeply in the paper, you can see that among the seven decompensated patients treated, only three reach SVR, 43%, and this is not a safe drug in this setting. SOF and RIBA, that's the study done by Neil Abdel, 48 weeks, and in child PUG-B patients, you are able to reach 68% SVR, good SVR, but not really the best uh, rating the other uh, competitors. If you look to SOF and SIM, uh, in the target cohort, there was very few patients report so far in child PUG-B, and all achieve SVR. And there is the other cohort report by the uh, US team uh, uh, earlier in the uh, ASLD uh, 2014 showing a 79% of SVR among child pukes B. But the problem is that we don't know exactly the number of patients who were child pukes B. So we get definitely more data for uh, soft DAC and soft Lidipasvir. And clearly, uh, I'm going to go through this data. We have very nice SVR rate among the decompensated surgical patients in this sitting. First, if we look to the SOLAR study, uh, both SOLAR1 and SOLAR2, and if you look at the overall efficacy of these regimens, Lidipasvir so Fosbuvir, either in pre-transplant or post-transplant, you can see that the SVR is high in child puke B, around 89%, and a little bit lower in child puke C. However, the most interesting information is that Regarding durations, there was no advantage to go for longer durations. And it has been already stressed by other days today, uh, we have no data on SOF and Lidipasvir without ribavirin in this population. So all the recommendations is made by extrapolations, but without data. This is the post-transplant data, again, the same result. And here I sum up both data, and clearly you can see that the SVR rate is higher, significantly higher in child pukes B compared to child pukes C, 89 versus uh, 78%. If we move now to the uh, soft DAC uh, regimens, we got this result from the Ally-1 study. 
which involve only 60 patients. And again, uh, it was a pangenetic study, but mostly with genotype 1 patients. And again, uh, there is a very high rate of efficacy among genotype, uh, among genotype 1 patients with child pukes A and B. But again, in child pukes C, you see a decrease of the SVR rate, even if the number are small. But the result present today from the early access program took only about two patients child pukes C. So clearly, we could not have any more information uh, on this sitting for the more advanced patients. So this, this data uh, really raised the questions on the child pukes C patients. And could HIV treatment be postponed in these populations on the post-liver transplant period? Uh, because we know that the results are very good at that time, and maybe it's the better option in, this, in these populations of child pukes C patients. Interestingly, most of the information regarding the soft and dark, uh, soft and dark combinations came from the real-life data from the UK, in which 467 child pukes B and C patients were treated mostly with ribavirin, 90%, and only 10% were treated without ribavirin. Uh, in the UK, the dose of ribavirin was, they, they were beginning by 1,000 or 12, 1,200, and then they were adapted at the discretion of the physician. So we have no real data on the real dose of ribavirin that received those patients, but we know that they begin usually at the dose of uh, 1,000 which is different to the SOLAR study in which the dose of ribavirin was beginning at 600 and then goes up to 100. Other data are coming recently with the associations of triple combination of sofosbuvir, daclatasvir, and simifrevir. And again, we've got information for nine patients, child pukes B, and again, the, result rate, the SVR rate is high, uh, 100%, with few side effects. We get also information now with the MK2 studies, MK2 uh, drugs, the Grasoprevir and uh, Elbasvir uh, combinations. In this sitting of child pukes B, the dose of Grasoprevir was lower down to 50 milligrams per day. You know that the usual dose is 100 milligrams per day. But take notes that, in fact, in this study, the child pukes B patients were mild child pukes B. Uh, they had a child pukes score of 7 for the vast majority of the patients, and only uh, 9 patients had a child pukes score of 8 and 9. The SVR rate is huge, 90%, and only 2 patients uh, failed, and uh, there was uh, no uh, safety issue, so it's an interesting solution. Another point, because we see that there is very high SVR in child pukes B, a little bit lower in child pukes C, so that drugs work. Is that improvement, is that SVR rate translate in improvement in liver functions and portal hypertension? That's a very good question. And if you look in the SOLAR2 study, for example, as has been already shown by uh, Didier, if you take the child pukes C patients, more than 50% of them improve their child pukes score, and 35% among the child pukes B improve. And interestingly, in this report, there was no uh, increase in the child pukes score among the child pukes B and C patients. Uh, and with uh, this very high SVR rate in SOLAR2, it was 93% for child pukes B and 77 for child pukes C. If you look at the male score, we see the same improvement. But if we see what is really meaningful in terms of improvement in male score, it's occur in 42% of, of, the, of the patients. And 54% have no change. I mean, meaningful change in male score is a male score change of more than two points. And um, this occur only in 42% uh, of the population. And that's exactly the same percentage that was observed in the real-like cohort in the British. In the, Brit, uh, uh, in the Brit cohort, you see that the improvement of uh, two point of the male score was observed in 41% uh, of the populations. And uh, more than half of them have no significant chance. In terms of portal hypertension, uh, we have only data coming from the suboptimal regimens of sofribavirin for 12 weeks. And what Neil showed is that uh, you could have, by the end of treatment, uh, an improvement of the portal hypertension in 24% of the populations, with more than a 20% decrease. But the only, this occurred only in patients who had a male score below 10 at baseline. So if you are dealing with patients with a male score at baseline with over 10, there is very few chance that you get an improvement in your portal hypertension. 
So, of course, long-term follow-up is needed because this is only obtained by the end of treatments and we need further uh, information. Now, who deteriorates? What's the problem of safety issue? We already go through uh, in the previous presentations by, uh, D by uh, Didier, but here is the cumulative safety data from Solar 1 and Solar 2. And clearly, as already uh, stressed by Didier, uh, most of the patients were between the male score of 10 to 20, and only very few, eight of them, were uh, at a male score over 20. Uh, there are classical decompensated cirrhosis with ascites and encephalopathy. And in terms of safety, uh, obviously there was most uh, serious adverse events compared to child fugues A, but that was quite correct with around 30% of serious adverse events. And in terms of deaths, there were more deaths among the child fugues B, uh, C than child fugues B, 9% versus 3%. But again, all these deaths is more related to the progressions of the liver disease that uh, strictly related to the treatment per se. And if you look at the specific serious adverse event, you can see that uh, the, uh, re uh, the, the liver decompensations in terms of sepsis, ascites, hemorrhage, or encephalopathy uh, occur in, a, in quite a large number uh, of the populations. And the same is true in the British cohort, in which uh, around 78% uh, of the serious adverse event is related to uh, the liver disease. And again, with a, a quite, uh, so that's been 21% of the populations. And in terms of uh, side effect, it's, uh, it's really uh, usual. In terms of ribavirin, so there is some difference between uh, both studies because everybody is using ribavirin. But uh, in the solar study, as it was already uh, stressed by Didier, they began by 600 milligrams. And globally, only 17% of the populations received the full weight-based dose of ribavirin, so a small amount of populations. And if you look at the median average daily dose, it's 600 milligrams. There was 70% of discontinuations and 30% of drug reductions. And you can see that around one third of the populations had an hemoglobin level below 10 grams and 10% below 8.5 grams. The Brits are more brave. They begin by 1,000. Uh, they discontinue the drug uh, very, uh, in a very uh, small number of cases, only 6%. Uh, they have a rubber in those reductions in less than 20% of the populations. And nevertheless, the number of patients that have an hemoglobin level below 10 is about the same, about 30%. So where is the point of no return? And that's where we have uh, some, a lot of missing data. What we need to have if to take the Solar 1 and Solar 2 and even the British cohort and try to look out uh, if you can find any threshold uh, in the male score which, in which uh, the safety uh, is favorable comparing to the, uh, the efficacy is, 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 uh, is, uh, is superior compared to the safety and to the improvement of the harmful of the uh, male score. So that's what we need, and this is an urgent uh, needs from uh, the study that have been already done. The only information we get come from the British, and again, so what they have shown is that if you have uh, less than 65 years old with an albumin level over 35, you are more chance to have uh, an improve in your male score uh, than to be harmed or to have serious adverse events. If you have an albumin level over 35 and if you are older, in this case, you have more chance to have a harm serious adverse event and a worsening of your male score by two than to get an improve of your male score. And if you take globally, in terms of liver risk, benefit the, hemoglobin, the albumin level below 30, 35 grams per, per, deciliter, per liters, you can see that in this situation, you always have a more harm serious adverse events and male wars that's improved. So that's interesting because that, so now what we need to do is to link that with efficacy and to try to find out uh, if there is a, a, a given population in which we can select the patients uh, in which we should not uh, go for treatments. So in the, the, the conclusions for the study was that for patients younger than 65 years old, if the albumin is over 35 grams per liter, improvement in liver function is more likely than harm. So uh, that's just give you uh, a, a small flavor. 
So in conclusions, I will say that, and that's the, the, the French conclusions that we have on our consensus conference, uh, patients with decompensated cirrhosis, uh, child pukes B and C, up to 12 points, not on a waiting list for liver transplantations and without comorbidity that can impact their survival should be treated with DA combinations. Patients with HEC and ML score below 12 should also be treated. Also, the long-term benefit of antiviral therapy to reduce the risk of HEC in these patients undergoing restrictions or ablations for HEC-related HEC is unknown. But we know that with PEG and RIBA, there is a benefit. So there is no reason why we don't get the same benefit with the DA combinations. Patients awaiting liver transplantations with a male score over 12 and below 20 without HEC should be treated. However, improvement of the MEL score may delay their liver transplantations, and this needs to be discussed with the transplant team. And the patients awaiting liver transplantation with a MEL score over 20 without HEC should be discussed for treatment on a case-by-case -case basis with the transplant team, because here is really the question whether we need to treat the patients on pre-transplant or on post-transplantations. So the, the, the threshold of 20 could be discussed, and I think that we will have in the next meeting, in the next SLD meeting, some information coming from the real life about this MELCOR threshold. And maybe the, the threshold is between 15 and 20. And finally, in patients with HEC and decompensated cirrhosis, the MEL score over 12, antiviral treatments may delay their liver transplant by improving the MEL score. And in this case, indications should be discussed with the transplant team according to the local transplant rule. And I think this is uh, an issue in which we cannot raise any definitive conclusions because that's really dependent on how is working your waiting list in your own country. Thank you for your attentions. Okay, just one question. We are restricted a little bit with time. In the U.S., where we have these highly effective therapies, one of the frustrations experienced by our patients is what we've now termed meld purgatory. We, we get an SVR, yet they can't quite get to a sufficient meld score to get to transplant. Over time, their clinically significant portal hypertension and other complications don't seem to resolve very quickly, and it becomes a conundrum for transplant centers. I was just curious at your own center, um, how, do you, uh, how have you approached this uh, problem that we see? Because it's very easy to offer these people treatment, yet with therapy being so effective post-transplant, we often wonder, is it the right thing to do? Uh, that's a very good question, and you can add on the top of that that you have the risk of uh, HEC occurrence in the meantime. So in this case, and that's what happened in the U.S., so you have now a trial because one patient was cured, improved their MEL score, and in the meantime, so was not transplanted. In the meantime, he had a, a, a HEC, and therefore he said, well, you cure for H. CV, but I, now I have MGC and I am not going to be transplanted. So this is a real issue, and I think that um, that's really depend on the on, on the on the speed of your waiting list and how. Uh, and it, it, how is the prioritization, for example, for HEC uh, in the U.S.? If it's, it's it's high, and if you can overcome this male improvement by the fact that you have, for example, HEC, it's it's, it's good. For the patients without HEC and in which you improve the male score, there is the risk of because you are not going maybe to delay definitely the transplantations. And these patients, in fact, and we have no proof now that by curing HCV, we are definitely put patients out of the transplant slits. So in this case, uh, I think it is really, uh, I think we need to discuss to treat the patients on post-transplant before them, uh, them treating them in pre-transplant. Thank you. 